Let us pray. Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts here today be holy and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I know I mentioned last week a little bit about a meal that was shared on our way home from Texas, uh, the Texas Mission Center. But I'm going to share a little bit more about that meal to start this sermon. So the five of us, Donna, Margaret, Todd, Bethany, and myself, sat down at this ridiculously good pizza place in Joplin, Missouri. And we got sat in the back by ourselves. Perfect. And we began to recap the week. We talked about the work we did. We talked about the, son, the Sanders family, the sleeping arrangements, sharing in the common experience from different perspectives and debriefing together. But then the conversation shift in only a way that us ministers really wanted to is it shifted and said, this was such a cool week. How do we do stuff back home? And I went, I think I made eye contact with Beth and was like, <laughs> this is what we're looking for. This is why we go and do these things, because then we come back here, and we're super excited to make a difference here in our community. So they said, how in the world do we go back home, we take what we did here, we come back home with it, and we do something here in Williamsburg, Iowa, or in Iowa County? Now, we discussed a little bit. Todd especially, he's a, he's a builder, he likes to do that kind of stuff, so he was like, we need to just get involved with Habitat for Humanity in Johnson County, and, and I know they also serve Iowa County from time to time, and I said, that's a great idea. We should do that. Problem is, is there's a major university there, so they're full. You know, there's always a college group doing something on a weekend. It's really hard for a church to be like, hey, can we build some stuff? They're like, no, we got college kids for that. But, and this sudden, spirit-filled shift happened. And someone, I am not sure who, brought up the fact that they had been reading the paper recently. And I don't know what the numbers are called, but the free and reduced numbers came out. And how it had taken a significant jump to 28%. Let us sink in. 28%. One in three kids that go to our school system on free and reduced lunch. That has the potential to be that one in three kids don't get fed at home in some way because there's just not money for it. Now, let that sink in for a minute. It was divine that Margaret Hall happened to be there in this group. Because if you know what Margaret Hall does for a living, aside from working up there at the Wool and Needle, She's a lunch lady. She's a lunch lady. She sees it. She has first-hand experience with it every single day with hunger. And she says the unfortunate reality is when that balance hits zero, we are told to move along. We won't take the food away from them, but we have to move them along because we can't just give it away. That's what we're told. In that moment, I watched Donna McWilliams and Todd Schmidt and Bethany and, and all of us just kind of sat there in this stunned silence, like, wait, wait, wait. Kids have to not eat lunch? Not eat breakfast? Oh, how do they, how do they study? How do they sit in the classroom with a belly that goes, Rrr. or the pains, the aches, it's plain and simple research that our brains need some sort of quantifiable fat every day to function at their highest level. They need fat. So when someone calls you a fat head, you go, yeah, that means I'm smart. We need fat. We need those things so that our brains can function. If a kid's stomach is growling, if a kid doesn't have nutrients in their body, how in the world can they pay attention? How in the world can they learn? One in three. 30%. It led us to a lot of praying. Me at least. And I believe Bethany. To a lot of praying. 
praying and a lot of thinking. And uh, when I got home, I called Dr. Garber. And I said, Dr. Garber, we need to meet because we need to have a conversation. And he said, super, let's talk. We'll get to that in a minute. Hold the conversation of one and three. Hold that thought. Real quick. I picked this text before we left for Texas. This is a lectionary text, y'all. <laughs> I didn't choose this. This is the divine intervention of the Holy Spirit saying this is what we need to hear. So here we go. So Jesus has come from teaching and healing and he crosses the sea. And he gets there and he gets on the other side and then, of course, there's a massive crowd, right? Isn't there always a massive crowd? I'm telling you, I would have loved it. It would have been amazing just, just for a moment. And there's this crowd, and they've seen what he's done, and they've heard what he's doing and how he's changing the lives of people. And he sees them, and he goes, we've got to go up on this hill real quick. So he gets away. They get up on this hill, and they're sitting there. And think about this. In John, the Passover's coming. The meal where they sit and eat is a unified family of Jewish people and they celebrate how God has redeemed them and saved them and set them free. Has set them free. So the moment of freedom, the meal of freedom celebration is coming. So he looks at Philip and he says, hey Philip, look at them all. Where are we going to go buy some bread? Philip goes, six months wages, man. Six months wages doesn't feed all of these people. There's no way. There's no way we feed all of them. See, Jesus knew what he was going to do, right? The whole time. He said, all right, Philip, I'm going to test you. What you got going on? So then Andrew comes up and he says, he says, hey, there's a boy here, about 10 years old. We got any 10 year olds here? No? Nine year olds? Yeah, Doug Bowles about three. Uh, you 10? You're 10 year old. So he comes up. He comes up with five loaves of bread and a couple of fish. And Andrew says, hey, this little boy's got some, uh, got some bread and fish, but what's that to so many? Have him sit down. <coughs> Have him sit down. He prays over it. And then he has him distribute it. Now there's many ways this miracle happens. Is it one simple act of generosity causes many more simple acts of generosity? Or is it just a genuine God miracle where all of a sudden five loaves turns into enough to feed 5,000? I don't know. Either one of them is a miracle, and both of them are really cool. They don't discredit each other. If, if this boy's act of generosity caused other people to open up their cloaks and pull out their loaves of bread and share with others, what a miracle. If Jesus broke it and said, bam! And, and through the divine, all of a sudden, it lasted a lot longer than it should have. What an awesome miracle. But a miracle happens nonetheless. Through a small act of generosity, a miracle happens. 5,000 people are fed with five loaves, two fish. But hold on. 5,000 are fed, and there is 12 basketfuls of leftovers. And I said it, I double repeated the scripture. They said they had what they wanted. How would they need it? They had what they wanted. They took as much as they wanted. And then they were satisfied. Come on. Those are purposeful word choices. They're not there by accident. They had what they wanted. And they were satisfied. And there was 12 baskets of leftovers. 12 baskets of leftovers. One and three go home there. One and three. I am realizing more and more that this may very well be my favorite miracle story. It may very well be. Water to wine is great. Walking on water is fantastic. Healing people is wonderful. But this is just unbelievably incredible. It's also the only miracle that happens in all four Gospels. Every single Gospel has the feeding of 5,000 happen. Matthew, it's 5,000 men. Okay? Well, I didn't count the women and children, so we might as well just say 10,000. This is amazing. I love that these people have trust and faith to follow Jesus 
maybe not even having heard or not even seen or actually experienced what he could do for them, but just heard. And then the basic human needs are met with abundance of love and grace and more than they wanted. 5,000. I'm going to be real. I'm realizing some things. I'm realizing some things about my call, who I am as a Christian and as a pastor. I am realizing more and more that I think my call, wherever I may be, is going to revolve around some sort of food justice ministry. It started in Georgia when I tried to start Hunters for the Hungry. Tell you what, they got codes in Georgia that will stop that from happening like unbelievable. I dealt with it in a cool group I was part of. I was on the executive board of it. It was called the Family Connections Collaborative, where business leaders and school teachers and pastors all got together and tried to figure out how to get people, well, not people, but young people to read, to be adequate, to survive, and to be able to study. I'm realizing now that as we walked the streets of Atlanta, while well, in seminary, when a homeless person came up and asked me, can I get some food? I do it. I've got my little brother to do it. One of the coolest moments of my life. I, it was awesome. My little brother was there either for my graduation or my wedding. I cannot remember which one it was. But uh, we were going through the underground, Atlanta Underground, headed to Turner Field. And it, it kind of popped down there. And the homeless people often congregate down there because, well, it, you can't get rained on because it's underground and it's warm. And, and he said, whoa, 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 whoa. He's got a small town boy from, from Nevada, a little freaked out by a large city and homeless, but he's never really dealt with it. And he said, well, what am I supposed to do? Do I just give him money? Do I just ignore him? What do I do? I said, listen, this is how I do it. If they come up and say, hey, man, I'm hungry. And I say, okay, I'll buy you something to eat. If they say no, I say, too bad, I'm not going to just give you money. He says, okay. So now I'm going to buy him some meat. He goes, all right. This guy comes up and he says, hey, could you spare some money? I'm really hungry. Now, in underground Atlanta, there's a lot of shops. There's a couple subways and things like that. And my little brother, I watched him. And I watched him think about it. And it was really cool. And he said, yeah, man, I'll buy you a we'll go subway. And the guy goes, okay, really? And Tim said, yeah. They went over and, and they, and the guy's like, and mind you, my little brother's just gotten out of the Navy. He doesn't have a whole lot of money either. And the guy's like, yeah, I'll take six inch, you know, just a little bit of, you're like, really, man, you're hungry, but my little brother goes, no, he'll have two foot longs of whatever he wants. I just watched, I watched the, the divine love and grace flow through someone who at that point in their life did not believe in the divine love and grace. It wasn't 5,000, it was one small act of generous love that maybe changed many. I have never been hungry in my life. My stomach has grumbled. Uh, I've had the dry heaves on the way to high school football practice because I didn't eat because I was being an idiot. It was early morning. I've never been hungry. I've never been on the gym. I've never known food insecurity. I've never known what it's like to go without a meal, without, a, without choice. I made the choice. I made the choice to fast. But I've never been forced to go without a meal. But more than once in my life, I've wasted food. Took too much and scraped it to the track. More than once in my life, I have gorged myself until I got sick. More than once in my life, I have eaten and ignored the hungry person sitting outside the window of the restaurant that I am eating in. Here's some research. There is more than enough food produced every year in this world to feed everyone twice. For a year. We produce enough. We produce more than enough. There's been a steady decline through the 2000s of people who were hungry. But there's been a sharp incline since 2007. 